afternoon's presentation uh, is going to be with Phil and I. Phil's going to go first, and then I'm going to come in second, and then there's going to be a little technical delay, and I'm going to show you some stuff in three dimensions, because I'd rather show you photos and images rather than you look at a bunch of slides with words on. So, um, so we hope that you brought your 3D glasses with you. Everybody has a pair? No, I'm kidding about that. With that, are you done? I'm done. Okay. You know yourself better than I do. All right. Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I'm uh, Phil Tanji. I work for Bimose Tribal Council, and I'm here to do a presentation on water service lines and uh, wastewater laterals, also called. Sewer, sewer lines at times. Let me tell you a little bit more about myself. I'm, I've been working with water and wastewater since 1996. And uh, I recognize a couple of faces here from courses that I've delivered. I'm a, a walking walk and clean water center instructor. And uh, I'm a class two wastewater treatment operator, class three water treatment operator, an applied scientist science technologist by trade, technical service officer for the Tribal Council. And with that, we'll move on to the presentation. Everybody knows where the washrooms are, I assume, considering this is the last day you've already gone through the, the housekeeping stuff. <laughs> okay, well, first of all, we'll talk about the presentation contents. What are we gonna talk about? Water service lines, we'll define what they are as well as uh, sizing. What goes into sizing your water service line, what type of materials are used in the construction of water service lines, and the same for wastewater. Wastewater laterals, we'll define exactly what those are, and we'll talk about sizing and materials. I encourage us to ask uh, questions, so feel free to put your hand up or just blurt out any question, any if something comes to mind. So what are service lines? It's that portion of pipe that extends between the home and the distribution line, or the, the main distribution line. Now in non-First Nations, service lines are the responsibility of the homeowners, the property owners. First Nation is the responsibility of, of the First Nation, along with the distribution and water treatment plant and wastewater plant. A pipe, hose, tube, or other line for conveying water is considered a water service line. Other pertinences include corporation stops, curb stops, shutoff valves, goosenecks, that sort of thing. And normal potable water pressure to homes tends to range between 60 to 85 PSI. A lot of First Nations water pressures are, are low, they're lower than that. And that's an indication that uh, there may be an issue with your jockey pump or the pump that maintains the pressure in the distribution line. So that's approximately 413 to 585 kPa. There's another picture of a service line. And here you can see the gooseneck over to the, to the left. Gooseneck or pigtail. The supply line. An alternate position for a water meter. Sometimes you can have a water meter installed on the outside of the house or inside of the house. And there's a image of the curb stop, the property boundary. Minimum size for a water service pipe is three quarter inch. That'll likely be most, uh, would be sufficient for most residential properties. I think we typically use one inch 
one to one and a half. They vary in First Nations communities. Does anybody here know what size their service lines are? It varies. Yeah, it does vary. Two, yeah. And it's mixed material too. The, the pipe is not always the same material. It can be, could be leg, could be plastic. Steel. So factors to consider when sizing service lines include the total water demands of all the fixtures. It's fixtures in the house, if it's a single family dwelling, or if it's a, uh, a duplex or a multiplex. The appliances, the auxiliary uses for water, future demand possibilities for water as well. What might be some examples of uh, auxiliary uses of water? Like laundry? Water parts? Water parts? Parks. Like water slides? Oh, parks, yeah. <laughs> That's definitely an auxiliary use, yeah. Swimming pools? <laughs> the fire hall? Yeah, that uh, could be an, an auxiliary use. Most treatment plants are designed to accommodate fire volumes and, and pressures. Pressure supplied to the building, and if it fluctuates throughout the day, that's something that has to be considered as well when, when sizing service lines. The rise in elevation to the highest fixture from the point where it enters the building. So that's head pressure within the building itself that you have to overcome. So all of these go into consideration. If you have a two or three story house, for example, or, or a commercial or industrial building, you want to size your jockey pump at the water plant to ensure that it's, it'll be able to overcome that, that uh, pressure and elevation and get the water to where it needs to go inside of the building. So here's a chart of minimum water service sizes required for residential structures. So it's dependent on the class of the building. It could be a single family dwelling, two family dwelling duplex, or a fourplex. And these are just examples. Internal diameter peak hour pressures greater than 350 kPa. The uh, minimum requirement would be a 20 millimeter line which is approximately three quarters of an inch. For those that prefer imperial measure. A two family dwelling, each, each side should have its own separate line. And four plexes should have a larger line, of course, so it'd be an inch and a half in this case here, 40 millimeters. And that's if you're dealing with peak demand pressures greater than 350 kPa. Now, if pressures are less than 350 kPa, the minimum requirements are 25 millimeters, which is a centimeter. Uh, two separate 25 millimeter pipes for a two family dwelling or a duplex. And the same for a four family dwelling. Same size would apply there, 40 millimeter. That's a peak demand. Yeah, at that particular house. But that that particular house, but it, would, it could include the entire community too, because like it's supper time, for example, when people are home or in the morning when people are showering, that's that's the peak demand for the community, and which would more likely be for the individual homes as well, because they're preparing themselves for the day, or making dinner or whatever they might be doing. So you always take the peak flow demands into consideration when you're designing something because you want, you want to know what your maximum is going to be. And then there's actually a, a factor that you add on to that too for, for expansion, future expansion of the community. It's usually one and a half times. You'll add another 50% onto what your, your current peak flow demand is, particularly if you're planning on expanding in the next 20 years, for example. A larger service line that a larger service line than what is indicated 
in table three will be required where in the opinion of the engineer. So you'd have an engineer taking a look at this too and if you're building something larger than a fourplex, then you'd have an engineer do the math, do the calculations, consult the, the building code and uh, determine what size of line would be most appropriate for that particular structure. Commercial and industrial structures, water services for industrial, commercial or institutional applications, they'll be sized and located according to all relevant codes and regulations and in accordance with current industry standards as presented in the American Water Works Association Manual M22. And that's something that an engineer would, would have in their possession and that's what they'd be consulting as well. American Water Works Association, they set uh, several standards for, for water and wastewater applications. Water service line main components, and I'm sure anybody here that's involved with the public works within their community or as a water plant operator would be pretty familiar with some of these components. Typically, typically there's only three joints in the water service line. There's the one at the corporation stop, there's the curb stop, and then there's the shutoff valve inside of the building. And they're usually brazed, or they're using compression fittings, or flared joints. Corporation stops, goosenecks, curb stops, main shutoffs. Does anybody know why a gooseneck is utilized on water service lines? Any idea? Pardon me? That's right, absolutely. Yeah, if for any reason, it's to protect the, uh, the corporation stop. So if there's any, when you're filling it back in, the gooseneck allows for movement of, of the, the service line so that no damage is, is done to the corporation stop. So the corporation stop is the valve that's installed on the water main by the municipality or the, or the First Nation or whoever's doing the, the pipe tapping. And that's usually done through a live tapping. Has, has anybody here ever done a live tap? How did it go for you? <laughs> Was it plastic or uh, metal? PVC? A PVC is not too bad. It's, it's a tricky though, and it, it's something that you have to practice to get good at. It's not something you want to do the very first time and not having done it before. You watch the YouTube video and then tackled it? <laughs> oh, a training video. Oh, good. Yeah, it's, it's better when you try it. A dry tap's good to start off with, you know, if you have the equipment available just to, to, for practicing before you move on to a live tap. But there's competitions too. You know, there are competitions across the country and, and in Ontario where you, you could do uh, live tapping. I think one of the best records for a, a full live tap on a live, well, live line is just under four minutes, which is pretty, pretty good. That's pretty quick, from start to finish. But that's with the trench, that's with it dug up and ready to go. The gooseneck, also called a, uh, a frost loop. It's an arch, arch bend in the water service line. It's typically installed to prevent strain on the corporation stop. And that's from the soil <coughs> movements and, and pipe expansion, particularly in colder climate areas. The curb stop is a quarter turn ball valve. It can be fitted with a, a valve key to turn it on or off. It's protected by a small diameter valve box. A curb stops, it's quite common for curb stops to get lost. So it's very important to identify them. I haven't been to 
working for the tribal council, we have 10 communities under our council, and every one of our communities, uh, there's at least one curb, curb stop file that's been lost. We can't find it. I was actually out at a community last week trying to find one. And in the wintertime, but they're pretty tough to find. They're, even, they're hard in the summertime, let alone in the winter. So it's always a great idea to extend the valve as high as you can, or at least the very least mark it. If you have a GPS or something like that, if, if you're doing an installation, if you have access to a GPS, mark it on your GPS, locate it, or even just take a picture of it or the area that it's in too for future reference. Because it's back in the days, a lot of guys, they, they didn't mark anything. They just relied on their memories and then you know, people retire or people move away. So then you lose records of curb stops. And there's still a, still a massive leak going on right now in Wabsamon because they can't find the curb stop. I suggested they isolate that portion of pipe on both sides of it, but they want to wait until it warms up. So they're still losing a lot of water from day to day. And the valve box, it protects the curb stop. So they can mark the valve box. And not every place has a valve box. The main shutoff valve, as soon as the water service enters the building, there's an isolation valve that's installed inside the building. And that's so you could isolate the water coming into the building for whatever for whatever reason, if, if you're changing or renovating inside the building, you've got your isolation valve. And that's generally where the water meter is located, too. It's adjacent to the uh, isolation valve inside of the building. So water service line construction materials. Back in the 50s, or prior to the 50s, lead was commonly used. <coughs> lead and copper. Today's materials are copper is still fairly used. It's commonly used. The lead is no longer used, though. But however, there, there is still lead in fixtures. Lead solder still exists. So there's still exposure to, to lead contamination. Lead's quite toxic, as we all know. The preferred pipe today is polyethylene pipe, or some form of PVC, polyvinyl chloride, either Schedule 80 or Schedule 40. The underground water service pipes installed below the frost line. And most of the time, there's a type K or a type L soft copper. And more recently, they're starting to use IPEX, or PEX is becoming the most common material. And that's because it's easy to install. It's plastic. It's, it's, uh, it's pliable. Give it another 10 or 20 years, and they'll, they'll find something wrong with, with PEX or plastic piping. There may be some toxicity in, in that that we're not aware of just yet. But. Lead's a toxic material that's harmful to human health, and there is no safe level of exposure to lead. Water may absorb lead from service pipes, potentially increasing the concentration of lead in tap water above Health Canada standards. And that, that generally occurs when water is stagnant for longer than six hours. When you're sleeping at night, if there's, there's lead near, near lines, it's always a good idea to flush your lines out first thing in the morning for two to three minutes. Or even just having a shower would, would prevent that from happening because the lead poisoning occurs when you consume the water. If you're showering with it, it won't have an effect. It's only if it gets into your, into your body that it could have an adverse effect. The best long-term solution is just to replace lead pipes, and that's what's going on. It's been happening for, since the 50s and continues today. How to determine if your service pipe is, is lead? There's a couple of methods. You can locate the emergency <coughs> shutoff valve in, in, in your house, it's usually in the basement, and check the color of the pipe coming out of the ground and into the service uh, line. A lot of old service lines are lead too, by the way, and this is how you can check to see if your service line into the house is lead or not. You might have to lightly sand the surface of the pipe so you can get a good look at the color. And my clicker doesn't work anymore. I think we went to commercial. <laughs> oh, we're back. All right. Hi, Mom. 
By, by the way, this is uh, broadcast live. I'm sure you're all aware. So if you want anybody you want to say hi to, <laughs> feel free. <laughs> so if the pipe is the color of a Canadian penny, then it's copper. So you may have to sand it to get that shiny copper sheen in order to determine that. If it's bright blue or black, it's likely plastic tubing with polyethylene. If it's gray, it might be galvanized iron or lead. The next indicators are the hardest are the hardness and fittings. Don't attempt to test the hardness of your pipe if you suspect it's plastic. <coughs> if it's a lead pipe, you'll be able to etch gently into the pipe with a sharp tipped object. Because lead's fairly fairly soft. You'll be able to etch into it fairly easily. So it's two methods of telling if your service line is going into your house is lead or, or not. So construction materials. There's another picture of a, of a home, the water service line. The American Water Works Association Standard C901 recommends polyethylene pressure pipe, a PE, and tubing. The tubing would be a half inch. The pipe would be anywhere from three quarters to three inches, or 76 millimeters, and that's for, for water service lines. And American Water Works Association's standard C605, underground installation of PVC pressure pipe and, and fittings for waters are outlined in, in that standard. So you're probably wondering if service lines are, are regulated in First Nations and wastewater laterals. The Ontario Building Code has, provides minimum standards. All of these documents provide minimum standards for not only installations, but for everything that has to do with, with, with the installation. So that would be uh, safety aspects, trenching, um, sloping. You have to be specific slopes in order to get a flow for wastewater laterals. We'll talk a little more about that. So these are a few of the documents, legislative documents. Ontario Building Code, the Safe Drinking Water Act, the guideline for safe drinking water on First Nations, protocol for centralized systems for water and wastewater, as well as the protocol for decentralized systems for water and wastewater. Applicable codes are the Ontario Building Code, and it dictates the water pipe sizing requirements. It's part seven of the code speaks to that. And that's uh, what's more, more commonly used in First Nations than any of the other documents. So what are wastewater sewer laterals? There's an example of one, and you can see that it's sloped. Because all sewer laterals are gravity fed. Either gravity fed to a wastewater collection line that's outside, buried underground, or to a, a septic holding tank from which it would travel to a, a leaching field. Or it'd be pumped to that leaching field. So what are wastewater and sewer laterals? A sewer line that carries black and gray wastewater from the sanitary fixtures and floor drains inside your home. Black water is basically just toilet water, and everything else is gray water. And that would include your, your laundry water, your shower water, dish water, brushing your teeth, water for housekeeping, anything else, washing your car, well, depending on whether you're doing that inside the house or outside, though. <laughs> so here's a couple of pictures of laterals leaving homes, one going into a, a, a typical septic system, and the other one into a wastewater collection system or main sewer line. Ontario Building Code 
0.4.94. It specifies the minimum size requirements for building drains and for sewers. Every sanitary building drain and every sanitary building sewer shall be at least four inches in size, which is 100 millimeters. Just as every storm building drain and every storm building sewer should also be four inches in size. That, that, that's at a minimum. The maximum permitted hydraulic load drained to a horizontal sanitary drainage pipe. And the Ontario, Ontario Building Code, Table 7.4.10.8, it outline, outlines what that maximum load can be. So pipe selection and design for laterals, based on the following criteria. The sewer pipes and the appurtenances. That's the first criteria. There could be a rigid pipe design. There could be a flexible pipe design. And the design, whichever pipe it is, flexible or rigid, must have at least a 1% grade. So it has to be sloped at least 1%, and that's to allow wastewater to travel freely. You don't want the sediment in, in your wastewater to settle out. That could create problems. That could create blockage in your line and eventually cause backing up of the sewer into your home. Now there's flex and uh, rigid pipe requirements. For rigid pipes, there's live loads and there's, and there's dead loads. So a live load, and that's what's taken into consideration when you're determining whether you're going to use a rigid or a flex pipe. It's what's in the area. If you're building or installing a, a wastewater lateral under a, a parking lot that's uh, heavily traveled, then the live, there's live load requirements. You have to bury it so far. It has to be uh, reinforced to a certain degree so that it'll be able to withstand that, that pressures, the constant pressures from vehicles traveling over, over top of it, particularly if it's rigid pipe. And a 1% grade would provide a flow rate of between 2 and 3 feet per second. If you should have a, a wastewater flow rate of less than 2 feet per second, that's when you'll be getting settling out in your piping, and that, that would definitely create problems for you in the long run. Other considerations include pipe depth, pipe location, pipe bedding. And the type of pipe varies by the, the age of your home. Clay, cast iron, or plastic sewer pipes have, have been used, and, and they still are being used today. Clay and cast iron are older types, and plastic's the newest. So it's very similar to uh, water service lines. Only the minimum diameter of the pipe is larger, plus the lateral sewer lines are are sloped so that uh, they feed by gravity in, into, that's one of the main differences, two of the main differences. They feed by gravity into the wastewater collection system or into the septic holding tank. In terms of home renovation, you might find yourself being steered in the direction of PVC or ABS, and, and that's what is most prominent out there now. So that's what uh, they'll try and sell you, because it's the easiest to work with, it's usually the cheapest. And as far as we know, in this day and age, it's, it's uh, the safest. It's not to say that clay and iron don't have their, their valid points, because they, they're both much stronger than PVC. <laughs> yes, Chris? <laughs> Yes, absolutely. Depends on, on the application, though. If you, if you have a, a multiplex building, you, may, you would have to go to a, a larger diameter pipe size. But if you're thinking specifically just for a single dwelling home, yes. then it depend, depends on the size of the home and how many people are living there. If, it, if it's a, a home 
where you've got probably 10 or 15 people, because the average water, wastewater that's generated per person, per capita is approximately 275 liters per day. So if, say, you've got 10 people, that's, that's 2,750 liters, that's, that's, getting, that's pretty substantial. So you might need that, that six, inch, six inch diameter pipe to uh, accommodate the wastewater flow in your home. <laughs> Yes, Chris. Okay. So would it be safe to design a sewer pipe for overcrowding? Absolutely. Yeah, when you're designing a sewer, sewer pipes or water lines, you always want to design them with a, uh, a buffer factor in there. And that's, that's where that, that overcrowding factor would come in. Yes, Chris. <laughs> Why wouldn't you have enough water? Because and how are the solids getting in there without the water? So if you have toilet water going mm -hmm. down a four inch pipe as a minimum for say a three bedroom home, and that typically is what you require. Right. It's kind of not safe to design for overcrowding because you may not have overcrowding, right? That's right. Oh, I see what you mean. Okay, so in the larger pipe. So in, in that case, then what you'd have to do is you'd probably have to slope it. And, and that's, that's what, exactly what you'd have to do because the, the slope is based on, on the length and the diameter of the pipe when you're sloping your, your laterals. And that's, that additional slope would, would, should provide for that, that higher um, footage per second. Because the minimum is two feet per second. The max is three feet per second. So a minimum would apply to the four inch. So for a six inch, it'd probably be maybe 2.1 feet per second would be your flow rate. So you design and slope it so that you'd achieve that, that flow rate going into your, your wastewater collection system. Thanks, Bill. <laughs> You're welcome. Now, yes? Yeah. You know, a four inch line is going to still be good because only one person is going to go to one Yeah, that's right. And, and that's, that's about, definitely a valid point. You know, a lot, but a lot of homes have more than one toilet. Like you, you look at homes on the market these days, they have more toilets than bathrooms. Or when more, to <laughs> <laughs> more toilets than bedrooms. <laughs> you imagine that? There are a lot of places out there that have more toilets, more bathrooms than bedrooms. Yes? Wouldn't you increase the pressure if uh, you did have a sewer backup? Pardon me? Wouldn't, it, wouldn't the pressure be more if you did have a sewer backup with a larger pipe? Oh, there, there would definitely be a pressure buildup in, in line on, on the side of, on the home side. Right. Do they have what? Backflow belts. Backflow preventers? You can install backflow preventers. I, I don't believe that's a common practice. Yeah, you could get a, you could have you could purchase backflow preventers for any size that you need, any size of line. But a common practice is um, is um, clean out lines, access points. Most wastewater laterals will have a, an access point so that on the outside of the home, so that you can just remove the lid and, and put a fish in there to assist in breaking down the blockage. Right. Well, maybe a multiplex or something like that, but then you would need more than one pipe as well, though. You'd need more than one line. But maybe a mansion. I don't know how they do it in Hollywood in some of those mansions there. I'm sure they have larger laterals there because they probably have more bathrooms than anything else. That's yes, Chris. Right. Um, to give you perspective, we just finished a building in Wabagoon with a septic system, 
for an uh, occupant mode of 260 some odd people. So a large community center and a band office, okay? And the hydraulic load for that size of building still only worked out to a four inch sewer line outside that building. So if you're thinking of oversizing a residential pipe, you're gonna be needing to pack a whole lot of people into that building. So to give you a perspective as to when you would have to go up to five inch, okay? We're talking three, four hundred people to go up to a five inch outlet pipe. For and that's with more than one toilet. And in this case, there was, as, and it's gonna seem really funny, there's nine women's water closets or toilets in this building, and then there's three uh, toilets in the men's and two urinals. So there's only five for the men's, there's nine for the women. So that's how it's, to give you a perspective. Yeah, but they usually don't go to the bathroom. Uh, exactly. <laughs> you know, we don't have a breakfast. <laughs> that's right. And they're still so using a four inch line there. And it's still a so. four inch, yes. Yeah. Excellent observation and comment, thank you. I just didn't want to have to do my presentation. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> There's a couple of photos of what the laterals look like. It's a four inch connection on that one. Both of them are four inch lines. You can see on the one on the right, a couple of different materials that are being used are dissimilar materials. So that would be the cleanup on the right? Yes, absolutely. That's the clean out. And that's it. Thank you very much. Most people have already asked the questions, but uh, I'd love to hear some more. Anybody has any? What, what is the guidelines for the uh, specs to run from the curb stop to the main? If it goes over a road, or if it's already under a road, and you have a storage unit, you can go over that road. What, what's, uh, sorry, what's... Uh, well, you got a storage unit, you know, it's going to be cool, right? Yeah. Yeah, it should always be for wastewater. It should always go underneath yeah, so now water and storm now water you lines. Have, you have the new storm drain put in. You have the old services from the fifties. You mentioned lead lines. Right. I'm not sure if any of those old lead lines had the connectors to keep it from freezing. So they can, you know, they can, now they do the uh, some kind of uh, junction they can use to electrically electric from bottles lights like instantly to freeze. Right. That's coming from the main to the service box uh, for each home. So I'm just wondering what the, yeah. uh, for the storm drain, when these water lines have to either go over or under, is there a minimum and it have to be insulated at what depth, you know? Or? Well, the minimum depth is uh, four feet or below the frost line, depending on where you're at. You always want to put it below the frost line. Yeah, but then you get a storm drain and you get 40, 40 below weather, no water. Yeah, there's always that potential there. Yeah, you can meet so that's, eight feet, still freeze your lines. That's when you'd have to utilize heat tracing or some sort of uh, insulating wrap around your pipe. Yeah. So I've heard of the rigid insulation between the storm yeah. and the storm sewer or storm drain and the, and the lines that connect to the main through the service box. And then you have the service box right that goes into the hole from there, which is heat traced the only now. Yeah, that's right. Heat tracing has, has become quite popular for water and wastewater. So the older lines, had, if, whenever you're servicing them, digging them up, that's what you'd have to do. Either heat trace them or, or uh, insulate them. So, uh, yeah, I was just wondering, what, what, would rigid insulation help that a little, you know? Or? 
When you say, what do you mean by original insulation? Well, just original. Styrofoam? You would lose, use some kind of rigid between the storm drain and the main or the service lines that come from the main service box. I think styrofoam would help, but it, it'd be minimal because depending on its R value, it's in the ground. You, you might have to um, compact it with uh, sand and use some other type of materials in addition to insulating it. And possibly heat tracing it too. Well, you probably have to heat trace all the way from the, the main, I guess, to the service box. The whole, I know we've, we've done some new ones. We've heat traced from the service box into the whole. I don't know. Have, have they frozen? Box. How's that working out? It works all good. We spent the fortune one year, five years by itself. So the benefit with wastewater, if you want to call it a benefit, is that it's usually it's warm when it leaves the building, so it's not like uh, I think the, problem, the gray water, the problem, black water the tends to be warm. Yeah, the problem came up because installing a new storm drain. And when you get down storm drain in the wintertime, it's cold, and there's nothing but air through there. And the lines are close by. Yeah, you'd have to cap it where the air's getting in, or at least put something there if you can block or prevent the air from getting in there. Then any other questions? Right, and that's as long as you go the box that you have or far enough out that the frost can't come in at more than 45 degrees. So that would prevent you that that type of so it'd be good to use that then if you're um, if you're installing a lateral on just above bedrock or something, if you can't go down too far. On shell, on, shell right. Installation. That's when that you definitely want to add the insulation to make up for that. Thanks. Any other questions? Ooh, I got one. Hey, Chris. Why am I not surprised? Okay. <laughs> so you build a new house, and you want to run water and sewer in one trench from the main to the house. How would you do that? And like, how, how would you arrange the pipe? Well, water would have to be always placed above the wastewater. The wastewater laterals would be below the water and be separated by at least 20 inches, I believe it is. So so you minimum. Like a, a trench and then like a flat bottom. Like how far apart would the pipes have to be if they were like on the same plane? In the same trench? Yeah. Five feet? Thanks. <laughs> They'd have to be five feet apart. Thank you, Chris. Any other questions? Well, thank you for, uh, for listening. And now my esteemed colleague here, Chris, will take over. And he'll continue to talk about plumbing on the inside of the home for water and wastewater. He won't? Nope, he went through it all. We're going to do plumbing inside oh. next year. What was required immediately on the inside of a house, or what size of pipe and what was needed right after. In that case, I guess that's it. Thank you for uh, attending. Oh, okay. So yeah, the only last thing that I didn't ask was um, immediately inside a house, you require a, a four-inch line coming in, the material that it is. Typically, 
ABS or some sort of plastic. And then from inside the house, you have to have a four inch clean out, followed by whatever your, the remainder of your sewer pipe is, typically three inch, because every toilet is required to have a three inch. But it, again, depending on the size of the house, it may be a four inch to a four, but typically the size of the houses that I've seen in the last six years have all been three to four inch. So that's one of the things I see a lot missed is that they come into the house with a four inch and then they convert it to a three inch clean out. And that's incorrect. You have to do a four inch clean out and then you can go to three. So that's one of the things. And that was it. So if there's any questions on my presentation. <laughs> So the question was, most common type of water pipe is typically uh, PEX within to the fixture and then they stub out with copper. In my case, that's what I see for all new. Um, there are instances where um, I've only seen one instance where there was a manifold installed for after and then each fixture. You've probably seen that on TV if you guys are home network TV junkies like me. Uh, most of the older prior rent homes that I'm renovating are I would say about 95 to 100 percent copper. And then, again, as you mentioned before, existing water lines coming into houses is varied. Right? Copper, plastic, go down the road, it's oh, copper or plastic. <laughs> There's three existing lines, and one was copper, plastic, and then they went back to copper. So. So it's a paper sewer. I guess if it's just so, so yeah. But I guess if it's sewer, it, you're not yeah. Use whatever you want. I guess they did back in dry. Well, they did. Right. Let's some. Let's go dig up some paper and tar pipe. Okay. What? what Inside is uh, ABS is typically after the cleanout. I've seen PVC before the cleanout, like outside the building. That's very rare, but typically it's black plastic ABS throughout. I haven't seen any copper to date. I don't think I have any houses that old anymore. I can think of maybe three or four that might be. They were built in the 70s that even may have light. I've never been into them. But I know I only have five houses that old left. Yeah, in 10 communities that are still from the 70s. The old cast iron ones too. The old schools had cast iron. Yeah, the school, yeah, Wobsomong just lost it. Yeah, and there was cast iron and lead and, yeah. And they still have that vacant. Yeah. Yep. Any other questions, Phil? Yeah, they kind of got a bad rap lately. Lots and lots of lead. Uh, one of the scenarios that I can think of that I'd like to share is uh, there's actually a clause that allows you to do uh, sewage ejection from a house. So say you're, 
uh, renovating and there's an existing or somebody messes up and that your sewer pipe going into the building is higher than, say, your lowest bathroom, right? You have a bathroom in the basement and your sewer pipe's coming out like halfway out your basement wall type scenario. There are, there's a picture where, again, it would flow into a septic, or not sorry, a sewage tank, a holding tank, and then from there it would eject up and there would be a back water, a back pressure valve on that pipe going up and then out the building. So there are instances where you can do, again, sewage within a home. Again, we're going to cover this next year, so I hope I don't get this question next year and you're all going to remember right now. But, but there, yeah, that was going to be a next year's presentation. Any other questions? Yes. So I'm about to get hit with the mic here. code utility rooms are supposed to have a three inch floor drain and one of the ways to sort of appease that is to provide unit only drains so in the case of hot water tanks you can supply those pans that have that little tiny little three quarter inch or one inch drain off the side of it that's going to be completely useless with that amount of 60 gallons at uh, I don't think anybody's ever seen 80 psi in our communities but 60, it doesn't matter. It's a lot of water really quickly. Because when the things fail, they fail quickly. So what you do with that water um, is you can either plan for that floor drain to go to a drywall on the outside, like rainwater collection, um, or sump collection, right? Don't tie it into a sump and then have that sump rely on a pump to get it out. I've seen that before. Or you can connect it via a trap, a three inch trap, and then to your sewage system. So again, it's a backup, and if you're not connecting it to your sewage, again, sewage, we require a trap, but if you're not connecting it, you're doing direct air outside of the building as an emergency backup, keep it below grade, and then put some sort of rodent pest protection on it so that you're not winding up having something crawl up that three inch drain without a trap or a water, something to prevent them from getting into the house, right? Yeah. And even still at three inch drain on a utility room and those things, it's still gonna be a nightmare, right? Again, we've seen that with uh, sumps that have failed, right? People disconnect them, crawl space fills up. So now they've started, or again, we've recommended Again, gravity solid drains at the top of the sump. Uh, whether it's below, typically it's below the footing, right below the footing level, to a dry well. So they'll take an excavator bucket and then fill it with ever loose community fill. Like we won't import fill, like three quarter stone. We'll take the best stuff we can find, like river stone or whatever it is, not like sand or clay or get rid of that, and put the best draining material we can into this excavator bucket sized hole to accommodate sump and overflow scenarios like that, like emergency scenario, right? Yeah. Any other questions for the next half hour? <laughs> I kind of have a question. How many raise of hands are from uh, flying communities or ice road access? One. There's gotta be more than one, thank you. Awesome. Because again, from Kenora, it's hard for us to prepare information for communities that we don't know a lot about. We've been, tr I've been trying for years to get into flying communities with other tribal councils to again, wrap my head around so that we can prepare better stuff for the complete audience, not just, yes. I've heard, I'm trying to find out. 
<laughs> yes, Kenora and Dryden, we can relate. Kenora and Fort Severn, no idea. Last chance, any questions? Everybody's shaking their head. Okay. Uh, closing ceremonies will be, of course, in the large room at the end. Um, you're gonna hear it again there, but everybody, safe travels. Again, please fill out the evaluation forms. We really need, we really, really appreciate your input. Does everybody have an evaluation form? Just evaluate Phil. I just ask questions.